Okay, good afternoon. So thank you for coming to, to our talk. We talk about crypto, but don't be scared. There's not, you know, no equations, no, no scary stuff. Um, so we're super happy to, to be here in Black Hack again. Uh, so very quickly about us, if you don't know us, uh, we come from Switzerland. We work for a company called Skuleski Security, and we do crypto stuff. We do research, consulting, card review. So you might know me for some crypto stuff I did. I talked at Black Hat last year and uh, DevCon Infiltrate. And I'm here with Yolan, uh, who did his master's thesis with me. And it's his very first conference talk. So he's been doing a good job in his master's thesis. I'm sure he will do a good job today again. Um, so it's a very small commercial plug. Uh, I read a, a book recently. It's, the paper copy is not out yet, but you can order it on uh, Nostarch, which is an amazing editor, by the way. OK. So today we've started about um, you know, saying, what, what does it mean to test cryptography? Um, Cryptographic software. It's like software, but there are some, you know, particularities specific to to crypto. And we'll present what we call differential voting. So that's a term I introduced like maybe a year ago. I turned out a bit differently than what I expected, but I'll give you all the details. And then we'll present the to the tool that we are going to release today. That we actually just already released. I was a bit lazy, so I put it on GitHub like one hour ago. It's called CDF for Crypto Differential Fuzzing. We'll tell you how it works. The kind of test it does, and we'll do a small demo before talking about the issues we found. So well, what does it mean to test cryptography? So like any piece of software, you want to test two things. You want to test functionality, meaning that when you send a valid input to your cipher or hash function or RSA, whatever, you want to get the valid output. So valid means conformant with the specification. And you want invalid inputs to be rejected. So you want your function to, to give you, to send you an exception or an error code so that the caller or the user can understand that something's going wrong and that there's an invalid input. So you also want to test the security of the software, obviously. So the program should not be abused by attackers. You should not have any you know, memory corruption or the usual stuff. And what is specific to crypto is that you want to avoid the leakage of secrets or of private keys of plain text, this thing. So it means not only leaks for, for example, memory dumps, but also leaks in terms of side channels, typically in terms of timing leaks. Okay. So what do you test against what? There's two basic cases. The first one, you test code against code. So let's say you have a baseline reference implementation of your cipher, and you want to create a new one, and maybe in a new language or with a different optimization target. So this is the ideal case, because you can have as many debug values as you want, as many test vectors as you want. And it's pretty easy to find the bugs in your new implementation and to, and to fix them. The second case is much harder. It's when you only have like a specification, a bunch of uh, A4 documents, which tells you how it works. But many times, it will not tell you like the internal and intermediate values. It will only give you a bunch of test vectors. And you have to fix and debug your own code until you match the test vectors. What's even harder is that sometimes the specs is not uh, complete, it's not you know, comprehensive. That sometimes happens in, uh, in pay TV. It's very annoying. So today we're going to talk about the first case, code against code. Uh, now about automation, automated testing. Um, there's many types of tools. The simplest one is static analyzers, for example, the analyzers in Klang, which will report issues about your software security, but not about the correctness of the crypto, obviously. The test vectors, on the other hand, they will tell you whether or not your code is, is correct in terms of functionality, but it will not uh, tell you if the software is, is secure, or if there's any bug or undefined behavior. Now you have maybe more advanced tools, like you know, what we call dumb fuzzing. For example, AFA is pretty smart, but it's still in the category of, of dumb fuzzers. It doesn't know what it's testing. It's just trying to be as smart as possible in order to maximize the code coverage. And it will typically look for crashes. So most people use AFL to look for crashes. You can look for other kinds of problems. So that's useful for crypto, but it will not you know, help you in finding the, the, crypto, the pure crypto bugs. Now you have the smart fuzzing. So typically, it's the kind of fuzzer that is aware of the API it's testing. For example, your fuzzer will know that it's testing, for example, a PKS, PKCS 11 parser, or it's testing RSA or AP. So then they will know which kind of input to send to maximize the code coverage and to maximize the, the number, of, number of bugs found. And now the more powerful approach is verification for mal verification, which can, for example, prove mathematically that one implementation is functionally equivalent to one another. Or it can also prove some 
security properties of your protocol. For example, it's been used to prove the um, forward secrecy and other properties of the WireGuard VPN uh, software. So the question is, you know, how to maximize the efficiency? Static analyzers are pretty easy to use, but not so powerful, and for formal verification is very powerful, but very hard to use. So in terms of priority efficiency, you have the, the red area here where you have smart phasing and formal verification. The test vectors is much, you know, lower on the curve. So we'd like to be, you know, at the level of the, of the question mark, get a good return on, on investment. Um, moreover, the, the method I mentioned, they're not, um, they're not perfect. They will most of the time not check the quality of the randomness. So randomness is very important in crypto because it's, if it's incorrect, then everything is insecure. They will most of the time not check for timing leaks. Uh, you have some Valgrind plugins that try to do this, but it's a very special case. And like I said, the test vectors, most of the time you get test vectors for the valid inputs, not for the invalid ones. Okay. And they will only look at, for example, the default version, for example, RSA, 2K, but not all the possible versions of, of RSA. All right. So how to, uh, how to do better with um, a new tool specific to, to crypto implementations? So what we call differential fuzzing is not renewed, it's just the idea of you know, comparing two implementations, but in a kind of automatic way. Uh, several people have done this before, for example, Solar Designer uh, tried to test his new implementation of MD4 by comparing it to, uh, I think, the OpenSL version. Frank from uh, Lipsodium uh, did something similar. But in these two cases, they were only specific to their, to their own tool, to their own software. So we want some, to make something that's generic, that not only us can use, but that anyone can use in their own software. Something that is agnostic of the language, of the API, and of the, the platform. Okay. So to give you a concrete idea of what it does, it's pretty stupid. Let's say you, you want to test hash function. So hash function in crypto, it's, um, it's a black box, something that takes an input of arbitrary size. It can be one bit, it can be one gigabyte and it will get you a small output of, let's say, 256 bits, which should look random to be secure. So now you have Rust program P1, which is a hash function, for example, I know SHA-2, and you have P2, which is another implementation of SHA-2. So your, um, the program, your further will try to generate as many inputs as possible that maximize the code coverage for your hash function, and they will check that P1 of X is equal to P2 of X, that for the same input, you get the same, the same output. So that's pretty stupid. Uh, it's a bit less stupid for encryption, so here the input generation is not just a message, it's a message plus a public key plus a private key that matches the, the public key. So P1 and P2 in this case are not doing the same thing. P1 is encrypting the input X, and P2 will decrypt. So you encrypt using the public key and you decrypt using the, the private key. And at the end you want to check that after decrypting the cipher text, you get the same input that you started with. So find signature is pretty much similar. You get a message, an idea, and you want to check that your signature on this message is, is valid. Okay. And now let's talk about uh, on YouTube. All right. So CDF is a tool we developed to use that approach of testing. So we wanted to do crypto, crypto differential fuzzing. So we decided to implement it in a way which was completely able to test executable in a black box fashion. So no instrumenting, no compiling, no nothing. You just get an executable. So we did it in Go. So we got the CDF executable, which can support many tests at once uh, concurrently, and which is completely language agnostic, as GP say. And we can test Go code, C code, Python code, Java code, whatever with it. So the bottleneck won't be our tool. It will always be the tested implementation because those are the ones doing the actual comp computations. We, well, GP started uh, working on the CDF in May and uh, I arrived in September and we mostly finished the software in March. So. Why would you use CDF? Well, CDF will do differential fuzzing on the implementation you got, but it won't test just functionality. It will test functionality through the differential fuzzing approach, but it will also do a bit more. So we decided to also test correctness and security of the implementation through unit tests. 
So we got a bunch of unit tests which will be run against both implementation and you can compare the outcome for both. So we check for insecure parameters, non-compliance with standards, and other edge cases which are interesting. So we won't replace formal verification at all. It's not really not the goal. The, the goal is to replace unit tests and do a bit more than unit tests. And it will also test interoperability since it's differential. So you've certainly heard of another project which is about unit testing. It's switch proof by a team of researchers at Google. They got really nice unit tests for the Java common crypto interface and they found a lot of bugs. So that's a really interesting approach and it's completely complementary to ours. So we could typically take their unit tests and run them in a differential way against the implementation we test. We do not yet, but we typically plan to, to do that later. So yeah, really interesting project. So how does CDF work? So say you want to test ECDSA. You've got OpenSSL, Embed TLS, Buncy Castle, a lot of libraries implementing ECDSA. And what you want to be to do is testing your implementation against one of those. But those won't have the same API. We don't have a common crypto API for all libraries. It's not standardized yet. It, it's a shame, but that's the case. So how do you deal with that? We decided to deal with that through what we call interfaces. So for example, if you want to test an ECDSA program, you will have to well, ECDSA implementation, you will have to code a little program which will work as a proxy between your API and our API. So currently our API is only on command line arguments, so CDF will basically doing, be doing exact calls on the implementation at hand with the arguments uh, in uh, yeah command line. So. For example, for ECDSA, if you want to sign something, you will just need to get the public key coordinates X and Y, the private uh, key D, and the message. And your program should output the signature R and S. If your program does just that, then you can use CDF to test it, which is really easy to code. So for example, in Python, it's like 35 line of code to do a proxy between a cryptography.io library. And Here you might ask a question, why do we need a public key for signing? Because um, in some implementations, they need not only a private key, but uh, they need more stuff than what they actually need. So we need to, to be as uh, flexible as possible to support as many implementations as, as possible. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes to implement, yeah, to get a private key, you need the public key in the private key. It depends on the API, so yeah. So the CDF interface are really generic APIs in command line. We will do something more AFL-like later with file-based APIs, but it's not there yet. It's completely black box, so you don't need to instrument your executables. And yeah, it's really, it's really silly, the interfaces. They won't do anything fancy. So for example, there you've got CDF on top. That's a binary or program, and it will try to communicate with your library on the bottom through the proxy interface programs. So if you get, I don't know, an OpenSSL implementation, you make a little program to just proxy the OpenSSL API calls to our API, and you do the same for yours, and you can compare them. It's really easy. So there is an example that's a full code of the proxy program for ECDSA in uh, Python. Th 35 lines of code, it's really quick. But you can test a lot of features with just that. That's the same for uh, Go, so it's a bit longer because actually there we support one more uh, additional flag. It's a detail, you can, read the, you, you can read it on the GitHub page later if you want. But. Yeah, and in OpenSSL, you've got all the pointers, you need to clear stuff, so it's a bit more line of code, but it's still fairly easy. Okay. So now, GP. Okay. So that's very few examples of that. Again, there's nothing complicated. We try to 
be as you know, simple as possible here. You can check all the details in our, in our code. Um, so very, again, the simplest case is that of uh, a hash function or a key hash function. So a key hash function is like a hash function, but you have a secret key, a secret parameter. So you can only compute the output if you know a secret key. So a PRF or pseudorandom hash function, pseudorandom function, or a MAC, they're essentially key hash function. So here, P1 and P2, they do exactly the same thing. So you're supposed to get the same output on the same input. So to, what we'll try to do is, in very simple, we send different inputs with different values, but with different sizes. For example, the DMT input, or input that are very long, or some input that is aligned with the block size, or that is not aligned with the block size, this kind of thing. Um, and sometimes we will find you know, some specific behavior. For example, if you look at the HMAC, uh, HMAC it supports different uh, sizes of keys. So let's say you have the key uh, one, two, three, uh, with the byte one, the byte two, and the byte three, and you have the key one, two, three, zero, then these two keys will behave, will behave uh, identically. You will get the same output for uh, the same input, even though the keys have different sizes. It's not a bug as a feature, but you should know that it's, uh, it works like this. Now, it's not ideal, it's not insecure, but if I were to design a new Mac, I would not do it like this. Uh, for ACDSA, uh, again, without all the details, so here, as we've seen, it's different. The first program will sign, will issue a signature, and the second one will verify in the signature. So if you create a legit signature, then it should be verified successfully by the verifier. So then we will, in, in some, uh, some libraries, uh, sometimes you will give them, they will accept a message, and the function ECDSA sign whatever, they will take this message of any size, they will hash it, they will get the hash value, and they will sign this hash value. Uh, in some other libraries, they do it a bit differently. They accept a hash, and they sign the hash. So they will not, um, they will not hash the message for you. But sometimes if you give them something you know, larger than the hash, they will just, you know, just truncate it and take the first 32 bytes or so and sign this, ignoring the rest. Um, so ideally it would be nice if they tell you, oh, you sent me something that's too long, I need to ignore the last bytes. But not all libraries do do this. Uh, we'll also check you know, for the you know, very abnormal degenerated cases, things that should not happen and that are insecure, for example, if the public key is zero. Uh, so if your public key, if your elliptic curve point is zero, then you know, bad things can happen if the private key is zero as well. Or if the hash function, or if the, if the hash value or message that you send is zero, uh, well then what happens? So I'm not going to the details, but you can guess what, what can go wrong here. So here you don't need to, to look at the code, let alone understand it, but it just to show you an example of test that we do for CDSA. So here the, the name of the function is, uh, yeah, test infinite loop here. So it tests whether uh, your CDSA signing function will enter an infin infinite loop if you send special uh, word parameters. Okay. Now for RSA, so we've been talking about ECDSA, which is signature algorithm, then RSA encryption will encrypt, obviously. So again here, P1 encrypts and P2 decrypts will try different size of messages. And as you mean RSA, you can have you know, different size of modulus, which is essentially proportional to the size of the message. Uh, you, to sign, you raise an, a number to the power of the public exponent. So the public exponent, it should normally be small, um, so that you know, it's, the encryption is faster. But the decryption exponent, which is usually denoted D, it should be very large, because it should be a value totally unpredictable. So, Normally, you should not have a big E. You should not have a big public exponent. You should not have a small D. If your D is very small, then something's definitely wrong. So you can test if whether or not your library will, will do this check or not. And you can also see what happens if you send a message bigger than what the function expects. Okay. What we're also trying to do, we're also trying to detect timing leaks, but we're talking about this yeah, in the slide. Uh, so timing leaks, it's very hard to detect. Because it's usually you know how how, some, how, um, how much power you how much time you allow to, to test to find a signal. Um, so we did not reinvent the wheel. There's a very nice piece of soft for software called Dudect uh, by Oscar Repara and his colleagues. I think it's written in C, right? And we just ported it in Go to integrate it uh, in CDF. It's very powerful. We were able to use it to find you know leaks of few nanoseconds. And well, the upshot there was that, oh, we have a timing leak, oh, that's great. Then try, let's try to exploit it. And we found out to exploit it, we needed way too many samples. 
Uh, but still, we found that there was some actual timing leak. Now, demo time. So, it's the first time we do the demo. Hope it works. Okay, let's hit play. Let's, let me try to hide this thing. Okay. All right. So there. Okay, you can comment on this. Yeah. What, what happened? What, hap what happened there is that we, in the first part, we tested the ECDSA uh, interface. So we specified its its ECDSA. So CDF is aware of what it's testing, so it can't use undefined interface. So there we tested it against uh, CryptoPP and Embed TLS. And as you can see, nothing wrong. If you send a zero private key, both are rejecting it with an error. And if yeah, you, it was fast in this case. Uh, yeah, I it, it went really fast, actually. But we can but see the next example. It is really fast. Okay, let me hit play now. One, and now three. if you, if you try again with an uh, Oh no, no it's MBTLS. MBTLS now, yeah. Okay, there you can see something okay. fishy is going on. Where was it? So what happened is that the embed TLS implementation accepted the zero One. private key as a valid key and signed the message without any error. So mm. that's really bad because the resulting signature won't be um, secure at all. So okay, yeah. let's continue. Okay. So if we if we go on we can test something else. So it's really interesting. If you try the OpenSSL and Embed TLS ECDSA implementation and you try to provide the hashes directly, so it's not the message anymore, they won't do the hashing, they will directly take the hashes you are providing. What happens is that if you get a zero valued hash, Embed, embed TLS won't sign it because it's a zero value, so it's completely well, screwing the multiplication, but OpenSSL will accept to sign. We're not trying to do OpenSSL bashing here. No, not at all. Yeah. So that's an interesting it's case. No RSA. And uh, also there, what we can see is that embed TLS didn't run into an infinite loop, but OpenSSL actually did run into an infinite loop upon malformed parameters. So that means you can DOS um, OpenSSL if you can provide the parameter. So that's not something which should happen, but who knows. No, yeah, if we try again uh, against RSA, OAP, nothing wrong there. If we try with the Go one, what you can see there is that the Go implementation won't accept a larger exponent than 32 bits. So. That means it's an integer, but that's actually not a bug. It's a feature because the yeah. uh, Go team decided they didn't want it to have too big uh, public integers because it's bad for performances, it's not really good for security, and so on. So they explicitly uh, made it an integer. So you can't use big hints mm -hmm. in, uh, as expands there. So you want to here is that many uh, APIs don't behave consistently. Sometimes they would be very conservative. And sometimes they would be very lax in what kind of input they accept. Yeah, so both libraries are not interoperable in that uh, regards, by the way. So if you have a big int exponent, you won't be able to use a Go implementation to do whatsoever you want to do. And now we are testing uh, timing leaks there. So oh, timing leaks. Sorry? It takes 10 minutes to compute. Yeah, timing leaks are really expensive to test because you need to do thousands of traces to get reliable statistics. So that's really l slow. But um, you get results, and you can see um, that's not really meaningful to you, I guess, but uh, those are metrics. And if we get past a certain point, like 5 for the max tau value, uh, for the max t value, then that means you really got a timing leak. If you get 1.8, like you get there, maybe not, maybe yes. So you have to run it for way longer to actually get anything meaningful. Okay, issues found. So yeah, what kind of issues did we found? So here you can see we tested uh, OAP, ECDSA, and DSA on multiple uh, largely used libraries. And for DSA, it's really bad. I mean, most libraries are not testing domain parameters, they are not testing the boundaries, they are not testing a lot of stuff, so you can provide invalid parameters and do 
yeah, crazy stuff like remote DOS uh, signer upon uh, invalid parameters. Yeah. Crypto PP was really good in that regard. We weren't able to fault it. It doesn't mean it's better or or worse than the other. It just yeah, they, Maybe a small they warning to people in Dodge. It doesn't mean that go crypto sucks. It's just yeah, mean that they true. they made some design choices. Uh, well. Well, the consequence is that they, they try to accept parameters that they should not accept. Um, I mean, crypto, crypto plus plus first pretty well here because they're you know paranoid. Um, yeah. But still, as you see, good, good. They fix they fix some stuff that we. Did. Yeah. So we reported uh, some of the problems for, for so for example for a DSA, as you can see here, um, if you provide invalid parameters to the signer it can fall in infinite loops or it can provide always valid signatures, which is something completely silly. I mean, if the signature is valid for any message, why would you sign it? I mean, yeah, why would you want it? So, so here is a um, picture from the standard, the DSS, so digital signature standard, which is saying basically that prior to signing, you should obtain assurance of domain parameter validity. So that's cl clearly stated in the standard, and that's also true upon verification. Prior to verifying anything, you should obtain assurance of domain parameter validity, otherwise you can't assure anything, you can validate the signatures. So not all libraries are doing that. For example, here, this is a, the signing process for DSA. It's, um, somewhat summarized, but basically you will generate a random k value between one and q. You will generate, you will compute r, which is the generator k to the k, uh, the okay. g to the k mod p mod q, and if r is zero, then no luck, you get a k which is a multiple of q, for example, so you, you just pick another k, and the probability of getting another one, which is, again, a multiple of Q is very low, so it shouldn't be zero again, but if it's zero again, you retry. But that's a problem if G is zero, for example. If G is zero, you can make zero to whatever you want. It will get zero most of the time, always. So you get an infinite loop there. So it's explicitly stated in the standard that the generator shouldn't be zero. But what if it is? Well, some libraries go on OpenSSL, uh, for instance, won't check that. So we reported the problem to both. Um, this is the Go implementation. It's a for loop which will always generate a new k as long as uh, r is zero. So they fixed the problem by limiting the number of attempts. So if you make more than 10 attempts, then it's not a valid parameter. That's a good detection, but that's not the best fix because you, don't, you are not checking the domain parameters. You are just mitigating the, the problem. So we also were able to uh, conf confirm a timing leak in RSA OAP thanks to the DUDECT implementation, but and that's a bad thing because RSA OAP, if you get timing leaks, you can get timing attacks and you can basically decrypt the message using uh, oracle decrypt, timing oracles, but... Yeah, I mean, the, the we, attack is not, not as well known as the Blaschenbacher attack on PKC 1.5. Uh, it's just a ciphertext attack, but it's extremely powerful in the sense that uh, just by using timing leaks, you can... Yeah, exactly. So, Munger's attack, it's called, it's really powerful, and we actually implemented it in Go, the Munger's attack, so if you want to play with it, you can too. And uh, we, were, we were not able to use it against the RSA implementation because the noise of the operating system is so big and the, sign the signal is so low that you need really too many traces to do uh, any attack there. So generally, we observe that most crypto libraries are really concerned about practical attacks, practical problems, but they won't really care about you know, domain parameters, boundaries, and such uh, details. So if you can't prove that it's a practical attack, they might not fix it or might be reluctant to do it, but it's, it's sad because it's not a good defense in depth. So they, most of them support weak parameters. They won't strictly conform, and yeah, mm. not a good uh, state. Okay. 
No, it's already time to conclude. We have time for, for questions. Uh, so, to summarize, we, we have this new tool, CDF. It does correctness and security of crypto software. Uh, it's only for crypto stuff. Uh, it's in, in Go because Go is yeah quite nice language, it's straightforward to uh, cross compile and portable. And we rely on this approach of comparing the behavior of different implementations. So you have maybe you need to have an implementation you trust in the first place, or maybe two implementations that you don't trust so well, but you just want to see you know how differently they behave, or just see if they can you know work together. And yeah, we found a couple issues, um, not so many, but we we, we focused on. Um, on what we believe to be the most secure libraries and the most widely used features. So we don't look for the low hanging fruits, but instead for the other hardest ones. So there's still a lot, of, lot more work to, to be done. Uh, we need more interfaces. In other words, we need to, test, to be able to test more stuff. Because uh, so we don't even test the Fielman or CDH, uh, which is like used everywhere. We need to do more tests. So if you look at Google's tools, they do you know, many more tests than, than we do. But they don't do this in a you know uh, different way, and, and again, yeah, we need to test more libraries. We just looked at maybe four or five different ones, the one that uh, are actually the most used ones. But maybe you want to test your own stuff, okay? And also, we want to well test our own software because that's probably a lot of bugs that crept in. So yeah, so you can find CDF at this address on GitHub, GitHub, Quick Security, CDF, and if you have any question, you can. Uh, Post it in the uh, issue tracker. Uh, we happily take pull request. And yeah, come to us if you have any any comment. Yeah, thank you. So questions maybe? No yeah, yeah. Go to the mic. Sorry. Um, so, uh, is this designed just to test uh, crypto primitives? Like, uh, would you use this to to test an arbitrary protocol that you know um, you we, might make up yourself yeah. for your particular application? Uh, we don't support TLS 1.3 yet, <laughs> and it would be way more complicated. One yeah. of the reasons is that we're completely stateless. Uh, for example, if, if you want to test hash function, w you will call the function once. You cannot use the update, update, finish. And for testing, for example, a more complex protocol like like TLS, for instance, uh, you would need something more complex to to do some useful test Understood. while being state stateless. We can so turn it into a stateful system, but it would be a lot more work. So as a um we should basically uh, use your results rather than your software in particular, right? Second. Because, uh, like, you wouldn't. Uh, I would. I would never actually implement my my own ECDS yeah. uh, ECDSA from scratch. Yeah. yeah right? so I should. I should only see your results to see which one implements it better. Yeah. Yeah. So you observe that if you don't implement your own crypto, which uh, I don't recommend that you do, if you don't have to. Uh, then the results of our tool can indeed be useful to to get an idea of how these are persons, how these libraries behave, and what security they do provide. It. Thank you. Yeah, um, you mentioned that the DSA standard says you should uh, test the parameters of DSA. Yeah. Um, is it specific about what to test? Because like this parameter testing is kind of a tricky issue. Like. For example, I know one of the numbers in the DSA parameters is a prime, and you can test whether it's a prime. But that's pretty expensive to do during a signature operation. Like it's similar with Diffie-Hellman. In Diffie-Hellman, you have a, you have yeah. these parameters from the server in TLS, and you could, in theory, test them, but it would be really slow to do that. Mm. So yeah, like yeah. testing if it's a safe prime or well, that, that's true that some tests can be expensive, but what you need to do is obtain assurance once that the key is secure. It, once you've got it, you can sign as many messages as you want. So you can just, if you are uh, maintaining a library doing that, you can just imagine, for example, adding a function to test the validity of the key. And once you've got the function, the user must call it when he needs it, but it doesn't need to be at each signature. So. Yeah, but uh, I can tell you that, uh, for example, a browser would never implement a test that would take one second before you can make a connection. 
Yeah, let's call it trade-off. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But DSA is hopefully no no longer in browsers. So. But if you Helm and is, then it's basically yeah, sure. Same. I was just. I mean, my question sort of. Uh, I'm in the middle here. Yeah. Hey, JP. Yeah. Um, uh, um, it's sort of like that first question, um, but. I unfortunately am in a position where I need to implement some of my own crypto for SRP. And while I understand you're not doing a whole protocol keeping state, the individual components of it, and I'm just wondering, well, I'm hoping you already have that in there, but I'm guessing you don't. And uh, in a sense, how easy is it to add new things to test? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, we built CDF in a completely modular uh, way, so you really can add new interfaces, new tests, really easily. So yeah, that's a good question. Great, thank you. I need this. You need to write some Go code. But, uh, yeah, it's in Go, but yeah, that's one of the reasons we, we pick Go and not CPP or Rust because it's generally perceived as easier to to go out for you know, cryptographers who are not very good developers usually. Yes, if there's no more questions, then oh, thank yeah. you guys. And uh, yeah, we'll give this talk again at uh, besides in one hour, so if you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you.